some beginning at verse one. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From God comes my salvation. God alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a, a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not let your plate set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their works. May God bless to our understanding and hence to our daily living the message found in God's word. Amen. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> the sermon is titled, entitled, Our Covenantal Relationship with God, and is based on the psalm that was just read. Our Christian faith is deeply rooted in the Jewish faith because the one whom we worship, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, was a Jew. And in the fourth chapter of Luke, verses 16 to 20, we read that on the occasion of Jesus' bar mitzvah, he accompanied his parents to the synagogue in Nazareth, and where he read the following from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable word of the ear of the Lord. The substance of that quotation comprises the poor, the brokenhearted, captives, the blind, and the oppressed. Those are God's chosen people, not the rich, the arrogant, those boasting with pride, rulers, or wealthy landowners, but the brokenhearted, captives, the blind, the oppressed. Both then and now, the people of Israel have tended to forget their original starting point when they were slaves to the pharaohs of Egypt, beginning of both Israel's history and that of our um, of our church. 
most important, immediately following their deliverance from slavery, the people of Israel entered into a covenant with God, a solemn, mutual agreement whereby they promised to be God's people and God promised to be their God. And thereupon, the agreement or covenant was sealed with God giving them the Ten Commandments as a guide for their daily living and as a constant reminder that devotion to God would always imply good moral action. Alas, both then and now, Israel frequently failed to do what was pleasing to God. And time and again, God forgave them for their trespasses. Now, as I've already stated, Israel and Christians both view the Exodus as their starting point in being called by God to be God's special people. And thus God only desires one thing both of, from both of them, namely a harmonious relationship based on the actions of trusting God and treating all of God's people justly. Now the Bible contains 150 Psalms one of which was read today. These are poetic songs of praise to God for what God has done and continues to do for God's people. The collection of Psalms has been a precious treasure for both Jews and Christians for countless generations. In fact, the Psalms were quoted more by Jesus than any other biblical source. And many of the great hymns of the ages have been based on the Psalms. Though many of them were written in the first person, they all reflect the ancient communal experience of God's people by reminding them what they have been called to do, namely to continue trusting in the covenantal relationship that they have with God. That trust is manifested in their praise for God's faithfulness and holiness and for treating all other peoples with compassion, with steadfast love, and with justice, and always with mercy. The scriptures remind us repeatedly that there is no way we can love God and not love other humans who, like ourselves, were also created, nurtured, and sustained by God. And thus I admonish you today that in both the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, there is no understanding of God apart from a corresponding understanding of good moral actions by God's people, extended towards the least of them, that is, those who are unable to give back anything in return. And now, since God is absolute, God is self-sufficient and does not need anything from us. But we mortal humans uh, are wholly dependent on God for our lives, for the sustenance and the pre pre preservation of our lives. And thus we should readily and regularly express our thanks by praising God for the gift of life and its preservation through all its troubles and tribulations. Now let us never forget that both the Jewish and the Christian Bibles, the Old and the New Testaments, have always claimed that there are moral implications for any understanding of God. In other words, theology and morality are intricately connected, 
We cannot have the one without the other. Theology implies good moral actions, and good moral actions imply trust in God. A wonderful book by the Old Testament scholar, Professor Bruce Birch, a longtime professor at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., entitled, Let Justice Roll Down, The Old Testament, Ethics, and the Christian Life sets forth three themes in the history of Jews and Christians. And those three themes are deliverance or suffering, deliverance, and community. Suffering, deliverance, and community. For both Jews and Christians, the three terms reference the suffering of slavery in, in Egypt, a deliverance in the Exodus and the founding of Israel as a small tribal community that later becomes a nation. And for Christians, the three terms reference the suffering of Jesus at the crucifixion, the deliverance of Jesus from death in the resurrection, and the founding of the Christian church as a small community that eventually grows into a universal institution comprising countless languages, liturgies, and conflicts. Nonetheless, the communal life of both Israel and the church center around the act of praising God for God's actions of deliverance and forming the people into a community of faithful followers called to deliver others from their suffering and welcoming them into the community of faith. In fact, that is what we continue to experience here at Church on Main. Deliverance from our various forms of suffering and the joy of being united in a covenantal community that remembers the journey and regularly praises God for promising all of us continuing deliverance from the pain and suffering we are likely to encounter along the way. Most important, our church, this church, is not a closed social club, but an open door community that identifies with all who suffer in any way. And thus we strive to help deliver them from their suffering and welcome them into this small community of faith and hope. Hopefully, we will all continue to praise God for all that God has done and continues to do by delivering us from various forms of bondage that have been inflicted on us by racism, sexism, classism, non-binary prejudices, and all acts of retaliation, as evidenced today by the catastrophic pain and suffering that Hamas and Israel have been inflicting on each other for more than three months. Where in our day do we see the fruits of the covenant that Jews and Christians have made with God? Where in our day do we see the evidence of faithfulness, trust, compassion, steadfast love, justice, righteousness? Where in our day do we see these virtues that imply God's abiding presence? Now is the time for you to respond any way that you feel led to do so. For those of you who are new, 
this is an opportunity for us to share thoughts that we have as we listen to God's word um, read from the Bible and spoken in the song. Whatever thoughts you have, please share. Okay. <laughs> you were saying, where do we see God? Uh, in our everyday life. Well, I think a big place you see it is right here. All that this church does for for the community and for um, everybody and for the fact that they are totally accepting of everyone. Um, I think that's a good, a big testament to God's work and what I'm sure it uh, pleases him. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And that's what we also think and hope uh, is the case, that we are striving by God's grace to identify with all peoples who are suffering, who feel left out, see you feel alone, and who need uh, the company of others and uh, that are given to them by God's grace. Thank you for sharing that comment. Yes, Alex. Thank you. Um, I feel like growing up, we, we were taught that in order for us to um, embody you know, being a Christian, we have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. Um, but um, if we were made in God's image, that means we all kind of embody him naturally. So, well, him, her, they. Um, so I, I feel like just, I think the number one thing we can always do um, is just acknowledge each other, you know, um, acknowledging that, you know, everybody is different. We all have different struggles. We all have different needs, different wants at different times. And, um, you know, when you're out just smiling, speaking to people um, and just being as decent as possible, you know, any anything that we can um, offer personally, like um, charity, um, you know, if we see somebody struggling, help them, you know, but just really acknowledging people because there are so many times we can be out and about and, you know, not see somebody, we ignore people, you know, um, you see people with a sign, you know, we're, I mean, especially me from the city, you know, I've always taught somebody is trying to like hustle you. So I'll just try to move past as quickly as possible, you know, but even if you can't offer them anything, just acknowledge them and speak to them. You know, I think that's the best thing that we can do um, as a starting point. And then where we go from there is up to um, what our higher power, what God has called us to do. So. Thank you, Alec, for those comments, which are very much in tune with what um, we've been trying to say today. The importance of acknowledging all of God's people, wherever we see them, uh, wherever we pass them, knowing that they are creatures of God, as are we, and that we should simply acknowledge their presence and their reality and their humanity. And that would be our gesture of responding to God in love by loving God's people. Thank you for that. Judy said on Zoom, I read a quote this week that said, God would forgive us if we don't get theology right, but won't forgive us if we don't treat our neighbors with kindness and work for justice in our world. Uh, and yes. that's from Judy. Thank you very much. Judy always comes forth with very strong, powerful uh, messages uh, that add to our knowledge of God and our responsibility in serving God. Thank you, Judy.
Okay, then thank you all very much for sharing uh, your thoughts at this time. And now we will move to our hymns, our praise. Uh, Lord, I want to be a Christian. It's another way of expressing um, some of the virtues uh, 